Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Independent Producers Organization Live Showcase. And as promised, this time we're doing the Portland Roadster Show. And we're looking forward to really seeing a lot of people that will see what we're doing here and make it out there in the middle of March. Just, just figure the middle of March. We've got this, and we'll show this just a little bit later. And I, I'm Richard Carpenter, producer, and this is Mike Edel, president of the Multnomah Hot Rod Council. And I think I'll have him go ahead and tell just a little bit about what you do. And, uh, okay. Well, thank you, Dick, for having us again this year uh, to be uh, at the studio here and uh, talk about the Roadster Show. The Roadster Show is one of our favorite subjects that we love. We love cars. And there's just a lot of components about the Roadster Show, I think, that touch, will touch just about everyone. Uh, this year's Roadster Show is our 60th anniversary. It's hard to believe, but it's been going on for 60 full years, since 1956. Wow. And this is a very special year for, our, for the show to celebrate 60 years of, sh of showing cars and you know, for all the car people to have a place to show cars in the Portland area. Back in 1956, when it started, it was basically started by an individual named D. Westcott, who you probably know as, uh, became the mayor of Damascus, and also Terry Shrunk, who was former mayor of Portland. Oh. And there was also some local city officials involved. But back in 1956, when the Multnomah Hot Rod Council started, and the Portland Roadster Show, was to get the kids kind of off of the street from drag racing and give them something, a place where they could show their cars and interact with car clubs. So that began the Multnomah Hot Rod Council in 1956, and at the same time, the Portland Roadster Show. Kind of an interesting fact, back in 1956, when they had the first Roadster Show, there were only 5,000 people attended that show that year, which was probably quite a few in 1956. This year, or the last year's show, we had over 30,000. So the interest is huge in terms of the show and the variety of things that go on at the Roadster Show is amazing. But it's just something, all the car people love cars. It's a place to display your work of art, if you want to call it that, and uh, also have a good time. So this year's show is scheduled for March 18th, 19th, and 20th. It's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday out at the Portland Expo Center. About seven, eight years ago, we moved the show from the Convention Center to the Portland Expo Center. And ever since that time, the car people have been extremely happy, and so, so have we. The, the show, in doing a show of this size, which we have over 300, sometimes 400 cars, vendors, it takes a lot of space, and the Portland Expo has just turned out to be the best place to have a car show. It's a car-friendly environment, and people that I know that attended the convention center years ago reached a point where they wouldn't go back because it was just difficult. And now they are all back at the conventions at the uh, Portland Expo Center. So we have a great show scheduled for uh, those three days of March 18th, 19th, and 20th. We do have some celebrities coming to help us celebrate 60 years. We've got Chip Foose back he, with us this year. And we have David Kindig. Maybe some of you know him. He has a TV program called Bitchin' Rides, which has gotten very popular with a lot of the young people. And we also have Johnny D'Agostino and also Gene Winfield. And these are two pretty well nationally known car builders. Along with Chip Foose, Chip Foose, I would say, is probably one of the top car builders in, in the country, in fact, even in the world. His name, his program called Overhauling, has been seen around the world, and his products that he builds and puts out is just absolutely amazing. Not only that, he's just a great person, and so is Dave Kind. All, all these guys are great people to have at a show, and... Uh, for the audience coming to see the cars and see the celebrities, uh, it's really a treat. So uh, that's kind of what we got yeah. kicking off here in just a very short number of weeks, and it should be a very wonderful show to celebrate 60 years 
in the Portland area. You know, I, I like all the cars that are out there. They're neat, but there's some unusual vehicles out there that I, I get a kick of. They, they even had one of those um, thing. It was like a traveling, uh, the old style wagon that uh, the horse doctor used to uh, travel around in. It looked like a house on wheels. There is. Yeah. You open the back door. <laughs> and I always got a big kick out of that. There goes back to 19, late 1930s. Of course, all the, all the cars do, a lot of the cars do anyway. Right. But there's a couple of, uh, uh, said, Homeyer's cleaners. And these are the same cars that they used to deliver the cleaning back in the late 1930s. And it still says that on the back of the car. And I, I don't know if that will be in the I show this year. But I don't know if that one will be there, Dick. But there are a lot of folks who are going back and restoring a lot of the old delivery panels and oh. those kind of things that were used, used a long time ago in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. It's something probably meant special to them. Or maybe, maybe their dad drove one of those cars back in the days. And the kids took and restored it and brought it to the show. We've had a lot of unusual cars come through the show. And actually, if you're, if you're any kind of a car person, from old to new, you'll find something there at this Roadster show to really look at because we cover the whole gamut of cars. It's just absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm, I know I'm looking forward to it because it's so many different vehicles from that time. And you, a, a person go out there and look at them and say, I had a car like that, right. or, or I, my friend had one like this. I'll never forget one time we had a, a 41 convertible that belonged to the brother of a friend that lived in back of me. Right. And we ended up pushing that down the steep hill on, it was Northeast 21st and Alameda. We tried to get it started and it wouldn't start so we ended up just leaving it down the road. I mean, it's just another example of the kind of things you remember about when you're working with cars back then. I think back in the days of the fifth, well, it's a matter of 30, 40s, 50s, 60s, we were all wrenching on cars, trying to fix up a hot rod or something very special. And uh, that's how you really learned about cars. And you got that enthusiasm developing and the Roadster Show just brings back those memories for a lot of people that maybe couldn't keep the car that, that you had a long time ago. And you'll probably find it at the Roadster Show. And it does take you back to a time when you really had a lot of fun, had a good time with putting the cars together and building hot rods. Yeah, I remember I was, uh, had a, a, an engine that I was trying to build up. I didn't care what happened to it. And then, of course, I had to leave as I went in the service. and. I guess they finally found someone that took it, put it in their car, and they tried to race it, and it blew up. <laughs> oh, you know, and it's, I mean, it was like all the dreams just went away. So all you can do is see those kind of things when you come back to the show here. Oh, yes, definitely. Those old-time uh, uh, carburetors, camshafts, things like that that uh, ha had names. Also, the uh, Multnomah Hot Rod Council, just stepping back a little bit, you know, being formed in 1956, and today we actually have, we have currently about 20 car clubs that are members of the, that make up the oh. Multnomah Hot Rod Council. Mm -hmm. It's just not a few people, it's actually 20 car clubs that support the Multnomah Hot Rod Council slash Portland Roadster Show. And most of the car clubs involved in the organization do a lot of special things for the community, and a lot of folks. And a lot of that's probably not publicized or known, but a lot of the car clubs put on their own little cruise ends or car shows, raise a little money, and they donate that to charities throughout the year. It's just amazing what each car club does to help people. Probably one of the most impressive car clubs, that, and I'm currently a member of, to talk about is the Farrell's Car Club. They have a mission, and their mission is called Missing in, a, Missing in America. What it is, basically, they have a mission to bury veterans that have, that have never been 
had the respect and buried mm -hmm. that, the burial that they should have. What they found out is across even Oregon, I think there's some six, 7,000 veterans in funeral homes who have never been buried and had the proper color guard respect. And this goes clear across the country. It's an amazing phenomena that's out there about how many veterans have never had their place uh, of rest, you know, really done right like it should be. But the Farrell's Car Club raises money each year through a little a cruise and they do out of Billy Bob's restaurant in Gresham. Every Wednesday night they have a cruise in and the money's raised from that go to the Missing in America project. And this is to bury veterans in Oregon or, to, to, or even across uh, the country to have the proper re burial and respect. So it's, it's something a lot of these car clubs do that a lot of people don't know about. And also they support Lines for Life, helping veterans that are having issues, uh, trying to prevent suicides, and they support and raise money to help these organizations help whoever they can. I think we've had them on the show too. Yes. Lines for Life, that sounds familiar. Yes, uh, actually. In a few months. One of our Miss Oregon ladies is a suppose that was her one of her platforms is line for lines for life and uh, the pharaohs have really picked that up and are supporting that organization so it's amazing what a lot of this the car clubs are doing that are part of the multnomah hot rod council they really get out there and try and do the right thing and uh, i'm pretty proud of all the car clubs that are in the council that uh, help people help veterans Wherever we can, we, we try and do the very best that we can. One of the other things that we got involved in about 10 years ago, we are a sponsor of the Miss Oregon organization. And we've had Miss Oregon's at the Portland Roadster Show since 2006. So last 10 years, we've been a supporter of that organization. And it's a phenomenal organization that we're proud to be a sponsor of. These young ladies who are Miss Oregon, it's not about all beauty. It's really about every one of these girls having a platform. They're out there promoting a charity or helping Lines for Life or mm -hmm. cancer. You can name it, but each one of these ladies has a platform that they work on for one year. It's a full-time job. They go out and do appearances like in Oregon, the current Miss Oregon does about 350 to 400 appearances throughout the year at different events. And uh, like I said, we're pretty proud to be a sponsor of the Miss Oregon organization. And this year, our current Miss Oregon is Allie Wallace from Portland. And unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight as we normally would have her here, but she is in Japan uh, with a trade mission for Oregon, trying to gain business activities for the state of Oregon. And actually the Miss Oregon program is, has been designated, or the, the, the young ladies and the program are designated by the Oregon legislature as the hostess to the state of Oregon. That's the formal title that they have, which is kinda, kinda cool. So this year, Allie Wallace will be at the show, Miss Oregon 2015, and we've also invited Miss Washington Lizzie Jackson will be at the show this year. Since we are Oregon and Southwest Washington, we cover quite a territory and it's just not always about Oregon, it's also about Washington and the, what the folks do there. So we're pretty proud to have all these folks come to our show this year and uh, help us celebrate the 60th anniversary. One, one of our past Miss Oregon's was on concussion. I remember that. Yes, we had- It was uh, a good, important thing. This young lady, uh, Allison, uh, was going to OIT, and she was her platform was concussions because she had suffered four or five of them yeah. playing yeah. sports and so forth. And uh, just to make that aware, concussion awareness to everybody, it's just something you gotta be aware of because the damages, as we are hearing about in pro sports, can come back on you down the road years later. So you wanna prevent that and you know be, sa be safe about it. I wanted to mention that in the background <clears throat> is last year's show, Cars. I mean, you'll just see going from one car to another, 
great DVD to have that. That, that was, that's really neat. And that's uh, really uh, a product of our Portland Roaster Show photographer and uh, his name is David Jothan. He's actually a member of the Farrell's Car Club. He's been our photographer for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And he puts those DVDs together. He takes a picture of every car mm. in the show and puts together DVDs, which uh, the audience or customers of the show, you come in, you can buy a DVD and actually see every car that is in the show competing. Yeah. It's really a phenomenal amount of work that he does. and. And uh, we're just really thankful to have him do that. It, it would have to be a lot of work. To it, it is. One after another. And that also, and that also ties in the putting together the, the DVD and all the photos. It really helps us at our awards ceremony on Sunday afternoon. Oh, yeah. We give out between three and 400 awards at this show. Sounds like a lot, but... We are a member of the ISCA, the International show, show Circuit Association, and their judges come to our show and do all the judging for all the cars that are there that want to be judged. And they are the ones that select the cars that get the awards. We do not. None of the people oh. involved with the council or the Roadster Show or whatever do not pick cars or have anything to do with that. This is a totally independent group of sh show judges that come in and judge our show. They also judge other shows around the United States. So they're very professional and they know what they're doing and, and looking at cars. So it's totally independent. Yeah. You, you can't say that we, ha we don't have any influence and we don't want that. Yeah, that's the right way. Yes. The right way to have it. I was going to comment about your um, the different clubs you you have in the Multnomah Hot Rod. Uh, is that kind of a geographical thing where someone's over in North Portland they'll, they'll go to the one out there? And, uh, no, not ne no, not necessarily. Maybe uh, the car they like. It depends on the car club, the people. Uh, each car, a lot of the car clubs have uh, different cars that they associate with. For example, the Northwest Corvette Association, Corvettes. There's a Viper Club. There's a, there are a lot of hot rod clubs who have a mix of cars. I mean, it could be a hot rod, 55 mm -hmm. Chevys. It, you know, it's just a grouping or different clubs have different missions like the Farrells and their mission. And so I think people join the clubs based on people that they like to associate with, the type of car, and maybe the mission of the club and what they're about. You know, whenever I see a, an old rusty car, a Model T or whatever, I always wonder how, how do they get new metal, a new material to replace in that vehicle? Is there, are there places in the United States that go out of their way to get this kind of Yes, there are, there are a number of businesses that actually produce parts oh. for the different models of the cars. Probably one of our local producers is Chevs of the 40s in Vancouver. They produce parts from 1937 to 1954 only. Mm. And they have parts reproduced of the exact type that were made on different vehicles. You know, the, the old Chevys or Fords or whatever. And you can buy these reproduction parts and replace them on, on a, maybe a car you're restoring. It's maybe it's full of rust. You can replace all these parts now. They're all being wow. made. And they're all available, I mean, for different, different, different businesses. There are businesses that focus on trucks and uh, different years and so forth. And so it's amazing the, the products that are out there to help you restore your vehicle. It would be impractical to try to put a vehicle together just for these parts, I take it. No, you could. Really? You could. If you had a bare frame and some basics and you wanted to build it back up and it was all rusty before, ah. you could put back that vehicle into original condition. Okay. All right. I'm just, yeah, I think that's neat. And so you're saying that all these different groups just depends on I mean, maybe they find out, well, I want just Fords, 
well, you got to go over to Lance or something like that if you want to do it. But really, you're probably already involved by that time. You're, you probably know somebody that. Yeah, are, so that's and that's another element of joining a car club if you have a particular collector car or whatever it is. Joining a car club, you get acquainted with a lot of people who have knowledge of vehicles, and that's how you learn about how to restore a car, how to show a car, all those kind of things. That's what I started back with in 1971. Bought my first car, and, and I got into a car club, and if it wasn't for some of the people in the car club, I wouldn't have been able to know what to do to, to put together these cars and make them really show cars. We used mm -hmm. to go to the Roadster show back in the 60s, and you'd see all these cars, all beautifully chromed, beautiful paint jobs. And you sit there and you wonder, how, how is it possible that somebody could have got this together and look like it does, so beautiful? Okay. Well, when you actually kind of uh -huh. do it yourself and you get acquainted with people that have the knowledge of what to do, how to do it, where to get the parts, all those kind of things, it, it, it's kind of a ongoing challenge to, to keep building a car and uh, and once you you learn how to do it you can do it well yeah. certainly well I like I, my, my point was is some of that material could be so old and damaged that you got to get well like you say but that just for a limited Chevrolet time frame right it's so not it's Ford, it's Ford, you want Ford and it's not limited to any particular model mm. or years. Uh, like I said, uh, you can rebuild, replace just about any parts uh, on any of the cars out there that you could think of nowadays. Okay. All right. Well, that's... Uh, I think uh, maybe just expand on that a little bit, Dick. Yeah. One of the things at the Roadster Show, uh, for the car enthusiast and the person that's building a car, we have over 130 vendors that come and set up booths and so forth at the show. Some of them will demonstrate their skills as far as working with metal, the tools you need. That's all, that's all, of, all there to be looked at and talk to the people who have, have the tools you might need to put together a vehicle. So we have over 130 vendors come to the show uh, each year. Also this particular year, as I understand, we've got well over 50 20 by 20 full displays coming and these 50 cars have probably never been seen or shown before so these are all new products that have been built and put together to be displayed at our roadster show this year so the quality of the cars has just been absolutely amazing that we're getting for the show they're in someone's garage up to now and yeah, probably. Somebody's or, been... Uh, storage or whatever. Yeah. Kept them up. Or a lot of them probably are just completed, completed the build on the car and they're going to show it first time at our show. We also have several cars coming that are grade 8 cars who compete at the Detroit Autorama for the Riddler Award. This is considered the highest award in the car world for a vehicle if you mm -hmm. can win that at Detroit. And the grade eight cars, there's a number of them they consider grade eight, and out of that, out of those grade eight cars, one of them is selected to be the Riddler Award winner. Okay. This year we have several grade eight cars coming to our show, which are phenomenal. Best in show. They probably yes would be best in show. Okay. So, that's kind of something to look forward to. Like I said, the quality of the cars, uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Also, we, as part of the Roadster show a few years ago, we, we upped our prize money to hopefully entice some of the higher end builds to come to our show, and it, it's working. Mm -hmm. We're getting them. Our top prize at the show this year is $10,000. Oh, okay. And that helps certainly bring in people from back east who do have a lot of the, of the high end cars and are competing, showing their cars on the show circuit. And they do come out to our show. Even if it costs them 10000 to get here. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. It's, there's, there's a pride in showing your car right. and, and winning a show. Mm. Absolutely. That's right. So we've tried to do those kind of things to enhance our show. Actually, our show, the 60th 
or the Roadster Show now is probably considered, we are considered one of the very best shows in the country. Yeah. If not, I could almost say the best, but our location, our facilities, our prize money, the, t the quality of the cars we get, and we have no issues at all uh, in talking to the other promoters of shows that show around the, you know, have shows around the country, uh, we are, we're right up there with, with the very best. And it's taken a good seven years to really move it to another level. And that has to be accounted to Dwayne Cassidy, yeah. our show chairman who took over about seven years ago and his efforts and his team's efforts, uh, including David Jothan, who's our co-producer for the last couple of years, They've raised the, the quality of the show up there where we are right with anybody in the United States. I remember <clears throat> him t saying that it's like he got up in the middle of the night and worked 10 hours before he even realized that he had been working that long, trying to just organize the whole show. Dwayne works every, every day. <coughs> Dwayne and both David, they're out there promoting the show, whatever they can do. It's a, it's a full year job actually oh, yeah. that they do this. And it's all volunteer in putting this show together. It's, uh, that's what we all, we all are volunteers. Because also a couple years ago we were, we changed our status. We are now a 501c3. We're a fully nonprofit organization. So any monies we raise beyond putting on another show we go to scholarships for kids going to automotive programs. We donate money to the Children's Randall's Hospital, to various charities. And uh, it's not about money. We don't keep the money. It's about putting it out there to help people. And that's what we're about. But also <laughs> primarily also to have one of the very best shows in the country that car people can come and show their car. Uh, speaking of that, uh, is, as I recall, you go down to Las Vegas to, to that. Um, I always thought that was interesting. When you go down there, there's a car show that you have to be in the business. In yes. Every, come in. I, every year, uh, we, in the first week of November, every year we go down to the SEMA show, which is actually the largest automotive product show in the world. And it's amazing. They have hundreds of thousands of people attend that show mm -hmm. every year. And people that have new products or are displaying products for automobiles, parts, whatever, tires, wheels, anything you can imagine, they have a booth at this show to display their product and hopefully a business or a company would want to come in and you know, buy their product. But it's only for businesses. It is not open to the general yeah, public. Right. You have to be associated with a business or organization involved in the automotive product world. So we go down there and our purpose is to talk to the, the vendors, celebrities, and gain sponsors. And we've done very well the last few years. We've had Summit Racing come out. We've had GM Performance come out to mm -hmm. our show with their full display of cars. Ford Performance. And so that's where you have, you have to go there to talk to the companies that uh, would have an interest in coming to your show and, and you meet the people that can make a decision to come to the Portland Roadster Show. Mm -hmm. And we go there every year and are very successful. And we were very successful this year. And a lot of these uh, companies will be at our show this year as part of our vendors. Okay. Again, I, I hope people are benefiting from seeing the... Uh, cars on the back of the back of us on the screen here yeah those uh, cars are from last year's show playing which are all cars that were in the show and uh, like I said this gives you a sample of what 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 yeah. type of cars that, that are shown there this year uh, one of our events or that we're having as part of the show uh, we're actually on a Saturday evening to help celebrate 60th anniversary we're having Johnny Limbo and the Lugnuts, oh. who are really a famous local band, uh, oldies band, will be there uh, Saturday night from 7 to 10. And Johnny Limbo and the Lugnuts have a really a true falling of folks that come to their show. And uh, 
we thought this would be a real cool way to celebrate 60 years and you can come to the show buy, buy a ticket to the show and if you wanted to bring a toy to come in and see Johnny Limbo uh, that would be great uh, actually the toys are tied to uh, a toy run that the Multnomah Hot Rod Council has doing each year the second Saturday of December we do a car run to the Randall's Children's Hospital up here on uh, Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we do is gather up toys for all the kids that are, that are in the hospital or have, will be going to the hospital throughout the year. And uh, in talking to their director, Sally, it's amazing. The Randall's Children's Hospital touches 60,000 kids a year right here in Portland Gee. and that is just unbelievable to us so all the car people our clubs we all gather together and we go out and and put out boxes to get donations for toys all the car people all the car clubs are gathering up toys and this last uh, December we all met out at Portland Meadows we cruised up to the hospital and everybody brought their bags of toys for the kids to put around the Christmas tree Probably over 10,000 toys was uh, donated uh, to the Randall's Children's Hospital, and it's a big thing when you, you know a kid comes in there and he's fighting cancer, and you know to uh, mm. give him a toy uh, is just it's just a big thing, and uh, that's one of the things we do, and all of our car club people do, and other car clubs even who aren't members of our organization come and join us to bring, out, bring toys to the Randall's Children's Hospital. It's a great thing they do. Cancer and a lot of other illnesses are just too prevalent today. And, and when you see a poor kid that's sick, it just makes you cry. You know, uh, it's funny. I'm glad you talked about that because they're bikers. They congregate at TriMet, the parking lot. And then they make a similar thing with toys, a run up to, to the uh, Children's Hospital on yes. the hill. Up to OSHU. Right, right. Yes. There's a particular name for the Children's Hospital, I think, but I'm not sure. But uh, Dornbecker's? Yeah, Dornbecker Children's Dorn Hospital. Dornbecker's right. Hospital uh, for kids, yes. They, they actually, the Saturday before we do ours, they, they yeah. all the motorcycle, car club, motorcycle clubs and and individuals get together and they cruise up to the uh, uh, Dornbreckers and take toys up there to the kids, mm -hmm. which is a great thing. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are, what club you are, if you can donate some toys and help a kid uh, have a better day, you know, that's, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, well, that's right, that's right. Um, let's see, I was going to ask about some of the other aspects. I still became aware of how, shall we say, subdued the sounds from cars became at a certain point in time. I don't know if it was 60s or 70s, but it seems like everything quieted down because they used to have Smitty mufflers and, yeah. and things like that. Probably back in the, yeah, the 40s, the 50s, 60s, and even the 70s to a certain extent. Cars were, I would say, probably loud, had louder exhaust, right. made a lot more noise. But when they implemented DEQ in 1974 in Oregon, oh. that kind of put a clamp on the noise issue. Actually, if you look at a lot of the modern cars now, they do put aftermarket exhaust on it, but they just kind of have a real soft rumble to them. They don't have that loud, loud exhaust noise that you were kind of used to back in the 50s and 60s. Never occurred to me DEQ was that involved was, in any way. Yep, that's kind of what happened in 74. Um, we weren't totally in favor of it as, as car drivers or hot rodders. We weren't uh, in favor of it, but it's uh, how things have evolved and technology has really taken over on the car world. Today, you can have a car with five, six, seven hundred horsepower mm -hmm. and hardly know it's running. Oh, okay. But it, you know, so the, the whole technology has changed quite a bit. But we still have a few people that like to hear the noise, and at some of the events, you can probably 
here at a cruise in you can hear them, but you can't at our show because these are all stationary cars. They're only there to look at. So you have a couple of cruise in locations that yeah, you... Yes, probably one <coughs> also this last year, the Multnomah Hot Rod Council, we were a sponsor of the Beaches Cruise In at Portland International Raceway. Oh yeah. Okay. Every Wednesday starting the first week of June to the last week of September, they put on a cruise in every Wednesday, goes from three to whenever you wanna leave down at uh, Delta Park. And Beaches started this about 20 years ago. And the goal was to raise a little bit of money to donate to charities. Well, this past year, actually in December, they have reached the goal, they raised, raised $2 million up to, for the last 20 years, up to last December. Mm -hmm. And each year they donate a quarter of a million dollars to a lot of various charities. Okay. They have a board that selects charities each year. It, it's distributed wide uh, to help different uh, charities and then it's mostly in the local local Portland, Southwest Washington area. And uh, each uh, summer, the cruise ends, uh, you can take a car down there and it's $5 to get in, that's it. It's a neat place to go for a summer afternoon or evening. Mm -hmm. And you're helping somebody that needs help in terms of charities or kids or whatever. And uh, you can uh, go on the beach's website and, and read about what they're doing, but it's, it's fabulous. And it's just another great, great avenue for the car people in Portland. Now there is also another cruise in that's yeah. put on by the Farrell Street Riders in Gresham at the Billy Bob's restaurant. And they, every Wednesday night or afternoon and evening, they have a cruise in kind of similar. You, you pay a little entry fee and I think they have anywhere from 70 to 100 cars. Oh. As where beaches, of course they have a, lot, a large area, can have anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 cars down there. But the monies that they've raised go to help the veterans. I mean, that's their, okay. that's their mission. But the beaches cruise in goes to help many charities. Of course, they have a lot more they, that they can help with. And uh, it's just, it's a, both events are great. It's just a great venue. Mm -hmm. All summer long, you can go to either one, have a great time, and get your car out, uh, and then where the sun's shining, you know? Right, right. <laughs> um, there's one out at uh, Cascade. Oh, yes, also, um, it's, it's kind of a phenomena that's kind of started. Maybe some of the car people know about it, some don't. But as an example, at a Cascade station at a Portland International Airport, every Saturday morning, from about seven to nine or seven to 10 in the parking lot out there where all the stores are. People go, car people are cruising out there and this goes on all year round. And they'll buy a coffee or a donut and go talk to all the car guys around there and look at the cars. This is happening in a number of locations that, we, that we've seen. And uh, I think uh, another good example is a few years ago, we had the opportunity to go down to California and meet with Chip Foose at his shop. And, and as part of, we took down, it goes a little bit longer, we took down Brendan Adams. Now Brendan is, was considered the tallest kid in the world. He was like seven foot six. Oh, He's, yeah. He is now way over eight feet. He has a, a dis, a growing disease, I guess you'd call it. But anyway, one of his wishes was to meet Chip Foose. That was his car hero. So we were able to work it out to take him down there to meet Chip Foose for a couple of days at his shop. And as part of this, Chip uh, said that we should go to this cruise inn over at this mall. It was a, a particular donut shop it put it on. And we happened to show up there on a Saturday morning, about seven o'clock couldn't find a place to park because it was just absolutely packed. There was mm -hmm. over 500 cars down, this was down in uh, by Huntington Beach, California, that these folks come there every Saturday morning, cruise their cars out there, of course, California sun shines a lot more than we do. Yeah. But it's amazing what the, what the car people want to get out and go take their car for a drive. And now it's kind of starting around here. We're seeing that same phenomena starting at different car 
uh, different uh, malls or uh, Starbucks or coffee, where there's coffee and kind of get together on a Saturday morning and talk cars and, and uh, have a good time. So right. there's definitely one out at Cascade Station is one to maybe go take a look at some Saturday yeah, if you don't have morning. anything to do. Okay. And then uh, maybe talking a little more about this year's Roadster Show is the same as last. Yeah. We also do a lot for kids. Now, part of our show, we have a high school challenge. And yes. there's approximately about 30 high schools from their, each of their automotive shops. A student will, will enter a car to compete in our high school challenge for trophies. And also we have some, uh, some top awards of money and tool chests and those kind of things, you know. Okay. So the, we, every year about 30 cars are, come in and they have their own area in the show and they're judged. And it's a way to promote the car hobby, the, having kids get interested. And when you come into a roadster show you know, as a, a student and you see all these cars and you get a chance, you can talk to, you can talk to all these car people and it gives you good ideas on how and maybe what to do with your car for your next build or whatever you're doing. But it's a way uh, the kids learn. Mm -hmm. And we, we support that 110% uh, across the board. We also, uh, last couple years, Dwayne Cassidy, our show chairman, and David have started uh, what we call our pedal car build. This got kind of started uh, on a fluke a little bit where Summit Racing donated us some of the small pedal cars. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we've given those out to various high schools or mm -hmm. and or community college. And the students that are in the automotive program who maybe don't own a car or don't have a car that you know, they could show at the, at the high school challenge or a roaster show, they take these pedal cars and they put together a design team. So by doing that, you're getting students involved who maybe can't afford a car, don't have a car, but they can actually take a pedal car, customize it, paint it, do whatever they want with it. Creative. The only, only r r rule that we have is it's got a pedal when it comes back, but they bring it back to the Roadster Show. And uh, before the award ceremony on Sunday, they will be auctioned off. And there are just people clamoring to buy these cars. They are just phenomenal, what they, oh. way that, the designs and the customization that they do for these cars. And then the, whatever money's raised from the little auction that we do, it's divided them up among the, the schools that participated, and then the money's given back to the automotive programs. So we've been doing that, and oh. it's another way to get the interest of the car hobby out there, maybe to, peop to kids that don't actually have a car. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes them, it's a good learning experience on how to customize a car. Some of them will cut them in half, expand them, custom paint jobs, oh. interior, all those kind of things uh, that really, really make them special. But uh, ultimately, the monies go back to help the... Are they, these, these cars that are about this long? They're about uh, four, four feet, five feet yeah. long. Okay. Just to write, like it's a pedal car like you had when you were a kid in the 50s or 60s. Oh. <laughs> tractor. Well, okay, right. it could be a tractor okay. too, but they pedaled, okay. you know, so these were a lot of fun and uh, they, they bring back a lot of memories for people and they are really collectible these days, the pedal cars, it's amazing. Okay. So those will be available for auction and on display at the Roadster show uh, uh, during the show. We also do one other thing that we've gotten involved in, which I think is really special and I, again, Credit goes back to Dwayne and David Jothan. We've actually started getting, buying wagons. Oh. And these are just the little toy wagons with the little wood side, sideboards on them and so forth. And uh, Dwayne got a hold of some of those a few years ago. And what happened was we had a, one of our paint companies, they actually painted up the wagon and and they did some pinstriping and made it really, oh. really nice. <laughs> and uh, they give it to one of the kids at Randall's Children's Hospital mm -hmm. who had cancer. And uh, I think, although the young man passed away about a year later, but 
this kind of kicked it off where we, we, get, we get donations from the car clubs, individuals, we buy these little wagons, and they're given out to various car, uh, car shops in, in the local area that will take and paint them and just make them all beautiful. Okay. They, they bring them back to the Roadster Show. I think this year we'll have about 24. And the, the Cancer Society brings in about 20, I think 24 young kids, and they can pick out a wagon to take home. Oh, okay. It's something special. Uh, that we like, we just love to do it, and uh, you know, again, for a young kid that's suffering from cancer or uh, illness, uh, this just makes their day. And uh, mm -hmm. those are kind of little things that we do at the show that makes it very special. Uh, obviously, there's other things that kids are in those hospitals for. Besides oh yes, the, yeah, it's amazing. When leukemia, or yes, anything you can think of, but. Yeah. When Sally was telling us at the toy run, you know, that they touched 60,000 kids here in Portland. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just hard, unbelievable to me, but they do. Uh, it's just amazing. So wherever you can help out, that's a good thing. That's right. Oh, huh. wow. We sure run the gamut today. That's, that's great. Well, you got to do what, you, what we can do. Um, all of us, uh, there's so many people that, uh, and there's so many car people out there that you'll see it, that will donate uh, prize money and that kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, to uh, support the, our event also that are given out to the kids and so forth. There's something else that kids do in the back there. They, they put together a little, they get modeled. We used to have a model contest uh, where kids could come in or bring a uh, small scale model, show it. And also, I think on one Saturday, if I recall, they would get these models that you can snap and put together. Kids would come in and do that. Okay. But we're not doing that this year. Uh, it's, we're kind of delayed on that. That's something we're going to look at next year. But we don't have that. Hard to do everything on 60. We don't have that event this particular year. So. We do have a great, we're going to have two souvenir booths at the show. We're going to have two entries from Hall E and Hall D. And we have a lot of great uh, souvenirs of the show. And one of the things that we're doing right now is the, uh, this is our Portland Roadster Show program from last year. Right. And actually, we are the only organization in the United States that I could actually say that puts together a classy program. We've never seen another to match it. And it's about 82 pages, has cars listed in there, vendors, and so forth. And you can advertise in this program. If there's anybody out there, if you want to put a, a business card or an ad about your business in this program, you can do it. And all you have to do is go to portlandroadstershow.com and the app, the Information is there to uh, go ahead and advertise in our program. It's really inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're not about really making money on the program. It's about getting it out there, advertising the show, and so forth. And also what we've been doing the last few years, we, since we're a sponsor of the Miss Oregon organization, we have the local Miss Oregon title holder come in and sell the programs for us. These are young ladies that, who eventually or have competed for Miss Oregon, like Miss Portland, Miss Cascade, Miss Washington, all different titles. They come in and help sell the programs for us. Mm -hmm. They're wearing their sash and maybe have a crown on. And it's kind of classy and, and all the car people out there need to buy one this year because this will be a collector's edition for the programs this year. Okay. It'll be very special. Okay. Yeah. So we're looking forward to doing that. But I think they're all good. Yes. All, all these are good. See it. What good paper. Qual yeah. Quality well, that's, paper. That's part of it. Like I said, there's no other no other indoor roadster show or car uh, car organization in the country that has a has one of this quality. Mm -hmm. But uh we're happy to do it. It's just a great uh PR program for the Roadster Show. Yeah. Definitely. Also, uh, 
Also, I might mention that, uh, you know, the last, if you haven't come to the Roadster Show for a while, but the last few years, not last year, but We've always had, we had George Barris come to our show uh, oh. the last three years prior to this one. And uh, George was 88, 89, but mm. his fame, he, he's built and customized over 300 movie cars. Oh. And probably the most famous ones that people would recognize are the Batmobile. Right. He, right. he has done that. And uh, he also done the Munster Coach from the 60s. He's done many other ones. The Green Hornets car, he, oh. he did that one here from a couple years ago. His uh, legacy in, in movie cars is just phenomenal. But we've had him at the Roadster Show, and uh, a lot of the car people had a chance to come in and get his autograph and talk to him. Very friendly, nice, nice guy. And a few years ago, we had actually the opportunity when we went to California to go down and see his shop down in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. and, very amazing, uh, the memorabilia that he has. Anyway, this last November, first week of November, when we were at the SEMA show, George passed away. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had an illness, he, he didn't suffer or anything, but it was a great loss to the car world to lose him uh, with such a you know, legacy. And then that's another issue. We have Gene Winfield coming back to the show this year. Now, Gene is kind of up in that kind of the age category, but he's a well-known custom builder. Uh, goes back a long ways. And uh, we've been having Gene come to the shows as much as possible. And okay. it's a great opportunity to get an autograph from these guys and mm. see some of their memorabilia, their photos, pictures. Uh, you may not have another chance. So that's you, another reason to come to the show and see some of these great people. You had a lady there one time. I remember she was in a booth over, can't ring a bell? Candy Clark. Was it? Was it her? From American Graffiti. Okay. Yes, we've had, uh, we've had uh, some of the stars of American Graffiti a couple years ago. We had Cindy Williams come out and Candy Clark. They both were in the American Graffiti movie and of course Cindy Williams went on to, to other TV shows. Okay. Became pretty famous, but two great people. And uh, the, the, the movie, American Graffiti, is kind of an icon with the car people. It really is. Every time I see it, I wanna, I'll watch it again and again. Oh. It just kind of takes you back a long time. And okay. So we do bring back a few of the stars of some of these uh, movies and uh, be part of our event, too. Um, I, I you know, believe it or not, we're, there isn't a whole lot of time left, but I want, are you able to tell us a little bit about Jay Leno's um, garage? Is that? Yes. Um, <clears throat> again, when we had the opportunity to go to California a couple few years, three years ago, when we took Brendan Adams down to meet Chip Foose, actually, we got the opportunity to go see Jay Leno's car collection. And that was because several years ago, we had a event here at the Portland Art Museum called Cars in the Park. They had about 16 custom cars on display at the art museum. Hmm. And as part of that event, which went on all summer long, we participated. As part of that event, they had Jay Leno come up toward the end of the event and uh, see the cars and he put on a one hour program. Mm. Dwayne and I were, were lucky to get to go to that and we actually got a chance to meet him, talk to him. Mm -hmm. And Jay said if we were ever down in California and wanted to see his collection, uh, we could. So when we were down there, Dwayne made a call to, uh, to their contact person and they called NBC Studios and they talked to Jay Leno and he said to let us see the car collection. Okay. So all of us got to go in. It's in about 10 warehouses oh. around Burbank. Okay. It, and it's, it was just uh, one of those bucket list items that you wish you could do and we just happened to have the opportunity. But Jay had 134 cars in this, in this warehouses and about 100 at the time, 120 motorcycles. Oh. What was amazing to me, though, was the artwork. 
on all the walls in every one of these warehouses was 12 foot by 12 foot posters that he had made of old memorabilia and actually put on the walls by the various cars. Okay. The, the artwork oh. was phenomenal. The facility was phenomenal. And of course, no pictures are allowed but in, in, the, in the facility, okay. but we did get to see all the cars. Their, their guys were great to take us around and show us all the cars, the motorcycles and, and their restoration facilities. That was just a one of a kind opportunity uh, that we just happened to, to get the chance to do. Happened to connect, okay. So uh, someday we hope to have him back up here and be part of us, but we don't know when that'll be. <laughs> 100, 130 some cars. What's also wow. amazing is every one of those cars, every motorcycle, and I mean every one of them, are fully ready to run at a moment's notice. Jay can walk in, I want that car, that motorcycle. You can fire them up and go. Mm -hmm. They're all licensed, insured, and he has a staff that keeps them up wow. all the time. It's, you know, it's, it's our dream, you know, to be able to do that, but uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of neat to see somebody in that position that really appreciates the cars, and he really does. He's a phenomenal guy, and, and one thing out of the program that he did at the art museum, he kind of told us how he got interested in cars when he was about nine or ten. <laughs> Walking down the street, and here was a, a, an old car, and there was a guy there, and, and uh, I think he asked the guy if he could sit in the car, and, you know, and the guy said, yeah, you can sit in the car. Well, he did, and uh, that, to him, that first memory of about nine years old, ten years, seeing the car, just stayed with him, and uh, he just developed the love of cars uh, to the level that he is today. Boy, that, that's quite and, a level. And he'll also tell any car guy, any car guy out there, if you have a chance, a kid's interested in your car, let him sit in it. <laughs> That'll be a memory forever. You know, a lot of car people were, when you fix up these beautiful cars, you don't want nobody touching them or right. sitting in them or whatever, but he'll open up any of his cars, any of his doors, and if a kid wants to sit in it, they can do so. Absolutely. Okay. I, uh, we're, we're that close to it. I, uh, we should go over just a bit. Yes. What we're talking about here. <clears throat> Portland Roadster Show, the 60th anniversary. And you believe it, March 18th to 20th. Um, probably get one of these placards when you're out there too. It's, uh, There's also uh, discount coupons available to okay. the show at Napa Auto Parts, <laughs> uh, Sunset Division. Uh, Les Schwab is one of our top sponsors also, and also Weston Kia. We have a total of 25 sponsors of the show that have really helped us build the show into the level that it is today, and we really thank all of them from Les Schwab, Weston, Napa Auto Parts, and all of our smaller sponsors, they're all important to us because we can't do a show without sponsorship. Okay, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show and doing this because I enjoy this. I enjoy hearing about all this. If you, we're about ready to go to a, a break now okay. and uh, we'll have another half of the show in about five minutes or so. But thank you very much for watching. Thanks for having us, Dick. Yeah, Appreciate right. it. There. Okay. That's just what we want.
Welcome back to the second half of the Independent Producers Organization live showcase. And this time we're going to do, I'm Richard Carpenter, producer, and I'm going to turn it over to Bruce Broussard, who will in turn introduce his guest. Right, right, Okay. Right. And a producer too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I want producer. you to do stuff and I want you to that know help that, me. I want you to know that Richard does a real fabulous job. We've been knowing one another for years. In fact, yeah, we're, that's we're right. Part of the, that, that original group, so to speak, right? Not that's too many right. Of us left, that's right. Not too many of us left. That's so, uh, Bob so, Headlam. Yeah, was, yeah. Remember Bob? Oh boy, boy got me guy. into it. Really miss it, miss Bob. You know what I'm saying? That's right. It's fantastic. Now we got Jim. Jim is still running around. You know, he's, doing he's still around. Yeah, he's you know uh, trying to back away from it. Exactly. It, I guess. Exactly. How often do we meet now? How often do you guys meet now? Just a second. Uh, this the, is it. The Second Wednesday Second of each Wednesday month. Of each month. That's it. So this is the piece right here now. This is it. I got to get together with you guys because we're going to have a candidates fair, and I want to make sure we work together on this. Oh, piece. okay. That's what I'm. Funded. That's what okay. I'm figuring on. Okay. Candidates fair, the twentieth of twentieth of this month, for that matter. Oh, we'll, we'll, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll all kind of discuss it and kind of get a sense of how to oh. put that piece together. It's going to be on a Saturday, on the twentieth. Okay. Okay. And we're going to have three hours to do some pieces. I've got some. Is that here? Yeah, this here. Oh, oh, in the, in okay. The big so we just all, all right. together. Mm. So maybe after the deal, we'll chat about it a little bit more. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very well, much. Everybody, you see, we're, we're business, right? We're having a meeting, right? To a certain degree. That's right. And, well, we, you and we just happen to have a show just to give us some, some idea of what the, the impact that we normally bring to the to the table here. Portland Cable Medium, right? Okay. Very, very important. It, it is the people. It's the people's show. And and uh, too often, they're not uh, given any consideration. And that's why it's so, it's so important to, for us to continue doing what we're doing here uh, in this marketplace. And in fact, cable access is throughout the state of Oregon, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, reaching that's the right. people across the board. And it's very, 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 very important. So, so with that, uh, we're going to give you sort of a sampling of some of the things that we do. Uh, Rich is going to be here with me and, and vice versa, and, and we're going to give you some idea of a sampling of uh, the impact of what we're doing. As you know, we're right in the, in the midst of politics and, and political, and well, we've got to pick up our leaders. You know, it is, it, is a, it is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And so we've got to select representatives that will represent us, i.e. at the table. Uh, from, we have local elections, i.e. to represent us from a local standpoint. Because the masses don't all basically serve at the same time. Mm -hmm. We elect someone to do that for us. And so it's very, very important to vet these folks to make sure we got the kind of representation that we want. And, uh, and this is going to be a good example of the show that shows you that we got a problem. we got to get back down to, to grassroots like it was at one point in time. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And I've got an excellent choice here with us tonight. His name is Bruce Cuff. He happens to be a candidate for Oregon governor. In fact, he's really a nonpartisan. Man, it has to be nonpartisan. Once you get elected, you got to represent all the people. That's right. right. And That's I was right. looking for the right guy. What party? Yeah, he, these are, he happens to be the Republican, Republican party. party. Okay, okay. But, but That's all right. Respect, it would be. Yeah, yeah. But he's a. But like I said, he, he he's a he's a really nonpartisan. Once they get elected, it's a, again it's a government of the people by the people. You're representing all the people. That's right. And so it's important to know. As, as I did with I vet I vet I vetted him in particular. There are, several, there are a number of other folks that are running for office, but we got, we're got we going to use one, and then in the candidates' fair, you'll probably see more. But we got we got Bruce in there. Welcome aboard, yeah. Well, Bruce. well welcome. Glad, we, glad to be here. So. We, re we represent the Republicans. Yes, right. I always wonder who represents the independents. The independents. We'll do that, too. That's the whole idea. Okay. <laughs> we, got, we got the whole the whole deal. All right. Okay. Well, we got, what we're going to do is that, um, again, Bruce is running for governor. He's got a number of issues that that he tends to be representing himself. But, but the unique thing about this particular discussion with Bruce, because he, he's going to be back on again, is that uh, there's an issue that, that, that's involved within our state right now that, um, that, that is in discussion, major discussion. And from this area, i.e. Multnomah County, the Tri-County area, we're not as familiar with the, the issue that's, that's outside of this particular area. And I'm talking about Harney County and, and BLM. You might, you, you, you're gonna, you're gonna get a better a, a definition of that from Bruce. But um, I thought it was interesting. I've been sort of following it on Facebook and, and, and trying to share oh, that with, okay. the, with, the, with the public through me and whatever, and through, and through my, my, my most uh, gracious person in, in terms of Kay Dirchie. Kay's been working with me for some time. And the bottom line is that uh, so we've been doing that, but I figured this would be a good time now to bring someone to the table because as you know, there, there was an alert just recently about the fact that the, the FBI basically is, um, has surrounded this wildlife area, this, this 
particular building. I guess some, some folks are in it and whatever. Anyway, rather than getting into that, I'm Bruce, welcome aboard. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank Why don't you, you just give us just a little brief background of who you are, Bruce, yeah. where you live, you know what I mean, a little background, okay. and, and why did you get into this piece of running for office? Well, um, my, uh, my dad was a barber in the Brooks area, Brooks Hayesville area, for about 43 years. And I, uh, sitting in that barber shop, I'd listen to the uh, farmers and the business people that were there uh, come in with just some common sense solutions on how to actually fix state government. When things were wrong or things weren't working the way that they should have, these guys would come in there and, you know, the conversation went something like this. Roy, was, my dad's name was Roy. Roy, you know what they need to do is this. Mm -hmm. And then one of the other guys would say, hey, that's a good idea. But you could tweak it a little bit, bit like this. And so they'd have this discussion back and forth. And by the time they got done, they really had a policy they could have implemented. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so, so, you know, but they'd always throw up their hands and they go, well, we're just farmers. Who's going to, who's going to, who's going to, you know, listen to us. So I used to say to my dad, Dad, you should run for public office because you have a brain trust here of all these folks mm -hmm. that, you know, you, that you could actually tap into to get some common sense solutions for what, what Oregon's done. Two years ago, I ran for governor and I spent my time in rural Oregon going all the way from, you know, uh, uh, Madras, Prineville, team, all, all the way through to Ontario. Uh, visiting barber shops and beauty salons and leaving my information and asking them to help me and asking them if they'd be willing to be part of a of a group of of uh, businesses where they could uh, I, I could develop it statewide that each representative and senator could call them up and say maybe they got 20 barber shops in their district and just say hey here's an issue that is going to affect you Legislation. You said, but you said beauty shops too. Beauty shops, okay, barbers. So that's, that's I went to the is. gun stores, the beauty shops, the barber shops. You know, men don't men don't gossip in barber shops, right? Wrong. I mean, it's not just limited to the ladies. I mean, the th the two things you're not supposed to talk about in public: religion and politics. Right. You talk about that in the barber okay, shop. Well, we got you your barber shop piece. Now, where do so, we go from here? Now, well, you, the, you live where? Where do you I, live? I live in a little town called Mahama, about Mahama. 20, 25 miles east of Salem. I, I was mm. born in the Brooks area, so okay. I've always lived in a, in a farming community. So I understand what, a little bit about, you know, what's going on in, in rural Oregon, because I've, I've worked in uh, farming communities all my life. My, my grandfather worked in the onion business all his life and mm -hmm. uh, uh, what not so um and what do you do now bruce i'm a real estate agent real, been doing okay, that for 15 okay. years and okay. so you know i got the stuff you know i him. got into i yep yeah, and, and you know we, you know we took we took the oath of office to protect the private property rights okay. and, and and one of the private property rights that is is under duress right now is the ranchers out in harney county oh okay. yeah harney county. you know and where is that located that's was, that's the physical well location. the the capital the the county seat for Harney County is Burns, Oregon, Burns, Oregon. and that's that's a uh, couple miles or a couple hours um, east of Bend. East of Bend. Okay. okay. Yep. So it's and it is the largest. It's the largest county in Oregon. Mm -hmm. It's got seven thousand people that live there, mm -hmm. and uh, there's twenty four hundred people employed in Harney County, and over a thousand of them currently work for the government. Mm -hmm. 300 of them work for the federal government okay. on the wow. on the BLM. So so part of the struggle over there is a lot of these ranching families that have been forced out, the jobs that are available. I mean, if you look at Harney County, uh, out of the 2,400 jobs, 1,400 private, 1,000 working for the federal government. The average wage on the private sector is only 25,000 a year. Mm. The 300 federal workers are making about 70,000 a year mm. plus benefits. And the people working for the state and county are making forty thousand a year average, so the industry that's there is basically ranching, mm -hmm. you know. And the ranchers, of course, they have their own businesses, but everybody that they're employing, they're not, you know, they're not able to pay mm -hmm. the kind of wages. So the the jobs that people are most likely trying to get are the federal jobs or the state oh, yeah. county jobs. So so there's a struggle in that community because there's so many people employed currently by government of some sort. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the, the Malheur Wildlife Refuge, the reason these guys chose that is the place to occupy is basically it was vacant. But the, but the, the wildlife refuge? The, the wildlife refuge, okay. right? Uh, that, those are Native Americans there. That's another thing. We, they, we have that, you have that relationship too. Right. Yeah. Want to share the, that a little bit? Yeah, you? they have. Well, the, the from what I understand is, is the, they, they, 
the Paiute tribe is there in the Burns area, and they have their, I guess they have, they, they have their reservation, they, they have their might, casino might the there, and yeah, they've got a casino there, and um, so, um, but uh, some of their artifacts are there at the mm -hmm. wildlife refuge, and, and some of that land was sacred land. That we're talking about. Yeah. That, that we're, we're talking, talking about, about. right. That's and okay. so they were, they were concerned that the folks that had occupied it were, you know, going to desecrate it. Mm -hmm. And from, from, from what I understand, they offered the Paiutes to say, come out and look. We're not doing that. Okay. You know, so, so and these guys have made it clear that they, that they did not, they weren't violent. They were making a protest. Um, they, you know, they, they basically, they were armed, you know, they were exercising their Second Amendment rights, but, uh, the the powers that be there the 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 sheriff and the and and by calling in the FBI he escalated it to the fact to the point where it just scared the daylights out of the people mm -hmm. you know these guys are 30 miles 30 miles or so out of town you know in vacant buildings occupying those they closed the schools for a week they barricaded the the sheriff's office they had the FBI at a BLM uh, building at the airport uh, and you know, I watch video after video where Eamon Bundy came right to town, walked, wait, wait, before we walked go into right that, up. Let's know before we go okay. in, because see, you know this stuff so Oh, good. yeah. And right, that's right. why that's why yeah. Richard and I we want, we're gonna get this information okay. out because a lot of folks all are right. gonna, let's go back to square one how this this thing all okay. initiated this stuff to begin with. You got ranchers out there, right? And right. It, it, it's got it's open land and this, that, and the other, right? Yep. Let's they, start day one. They had one. they have they had, you know, the ranchers out there, they own a lot of them own a certain amount of land and right. then they have grazing rights on, okay. on the on the BLM lands that are that are outside of that. And BLM is becoming more and more restrictive on what they're allowing. Now, the, the Bundys believe, as, as I've come to understand, that the Constitution of the United States does not give the federal government the right to manage public lands. Oregon is 53% managed. The public lands belong to the state of Oregon, but the, but the 53% of it is controlled and managed by the federal government. Yeah. You know, and if you, it, in the, the articles that they point to in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 17, when you read that, that actually gives the federal government the right, it tells them how much land they can own. It basically gives them the 10 square miles for Washington, D.C. The other things are limited to defense type forts, ports, okay. and they can only own those and operate those if they purchase them from the states with the state legislature legislature's permission that's what that's what our our constitution says but as our as our country grew to the west uh, they stopped transferring those land as soon mm -hmm. as the land became a state that land should have been transferred to the state and and the federal government did not do this the lands in the western states you know Oregon's 53 percent I be I believe Nevada is over 80 percent managed controlled by by the federal government so that's the rub and so the uh, this started with um, Steve and Dwight Hammond, okay. who who were accused of of uh, they were ranchers, right? They were ranchers. Right? Okay. They they went to court and they were accused of uh, of arson, setting fires on the on their land and on the BLM okay. adjacent to them, fires that occurred late '90s, early 2000s, and they're prosecuting them over 10 years later for arson. And the the setting of fire. What, what, set, what well, they were burning. They were burning. Land, it, right? Well, it's a normal ranching practice to okay. burn off scrub brush. So okay. they were burning off this juniper off of their and off you know of their ranch. off of their land, and, okay. and it went on to okay. the BLM land. Oh, okay. But I don't know. Do you know any arsonists that put out their own fires? Hmm. Both the fires that these guys were accused of setting, they actually extinguished the fire themselves. So. You know, it, the one of them, I, I believe, it got a little out of hand. And but if you watch some of the videos I've seen, the BLM is it. They they do the same thing. And I watched one video where they torched all the way around this guy's cattle. The guy lost 11 head of cattle that they just burned up mm. tr trying to backfire. Mm. You know, to control this fire. And there's nothing that's hap nothing happens to those folks. Now you got the dispute. Now they're, they're taking them to court, right? As a well, they the, yeah. So so the first time around. So the the U.S. prosecutor 
uh, if you look at the BLM statutes, the maximum sentence that somebody can be uh, uh, sent to jail for is a year, up to a year, okay. for, for doing something on the BLM land. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't use that statute because could they could only send them to jail for a year. And I believe what they're really after was they wanted these people's ranch to make that part of the refuge, to extend the refuge because th they bought out other ranchers or flooded them out and you know purchased them and, and extended well, well, their reach but initially so, though you said initially they went to court right yeah and then they were found so-called guilty well they were year and they, six months they were found they were found guilty okay. the, the, and the federal prosecutor chose not to use the blm statute but rather to use the terrorist statute okay and the terrorist statute has a maximum sentence of death and a minimum sentence of five years okay so when the judge actually ruled on it and they were found guilty of these two fires because and basically they were found guilty because they admitted those two they admitted to yeah, actually setting it, it because right. Right. you know they were trying to control one of them was 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 a, a burn but the other was actually set to protect their own house okay. and their winter crop so, and and they distinguished both of those well when the judge got to the sentencing phase he viewed that five-year minimum sentence, he called it, it would have been cruel and unusual punishment. That was to the judge. Send, the, judge the judge said that would be cruel and unusual punishment to send them to jail for five years. So he sent um, was Steve. Was that state court or federal court? Uh, I believe I, it is federal court. It was federal it was, court. It was, okay. Yep. Right. Federal, okay. And, and, but he sent um, Steve to jail for a year and he okay. sent Dwight to jail for three months yeah, and uh, Steve is in his 40s early 40s mm -hmm. and Dwight's in his 70s okay okay so father son so uh, and and part of the the settlement here is they also gave him a civil penalty of four hundred thousand dollar fine mm -hmm. and and this is how transparent to me that it appears that they were after the ranch is because part of the settlement included a first rider refusal for the BLM to take possession of their ranch if they ever sold it or mm, lost it. Mm, mm, so mm. what's suspect is if, if, if you send somebody to jail for a year, one guy for a year and one guy for three months, and you don't think that sentence is right, it looks like when they were in jail, you would go back to court and say, hey, the judge didn't rule properly that minimum five-year sentence, that's what they should have done. Well, these guys spent their three, years in, or three months in jail and their year in jail, and they got out, and they still didn't lose their ranch to these folks. And they owed, still owed four hundred thousand. Right? And they still they still uh, owed four hundred thousand, and and it. and they had to pay that by the end of this year, and they paid it. And one of the other things really? that they couldn't do is they weren't allowed to appeal. They, allowed to appeal. they weren't allowed to appeal. Part of their agreement was they weren't allowed to appeal. So, but the government appealed. Appeal. Yeah. Oh, the government appealed. The All government right. said, "Hey, look, they didn't serve their five years. They need to go back to prison." Now, most places when you get when you get sentenced twice. For the same crimes, that's considered double jeopardy. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, mm -hmm. so why, why should that, you know? So they're really after these guys. But what ran. about the judge who sent us to begin with? Did he object in any way, shape, or form? Well, what happened to him? The the day that he was he passed that sentence, they were serving cake in the courtroom because he was retiring that day. Oh. So he was done. Okay. So so uh, the prosecutor in Portland and and uh, I I don't have her name on the top of my head, but. Anyway, she, she was one that, that they were removed from her, her job recently for some... Uh, uh, whatever reason. Yeah, whatever reason. But anyway, she had an agenda. You know, she had a certain agenda, that, and that's why she, she brought them up to send them to jail for five years. But now you got a new judge. So, so the Bundy showed up before these guys, because these guys had to report to jail this year, like at the beginning of this year in January, okay. to, to, to go to jail. The Bundy showed up in October or so and they and they they met with the they met with the Hammonds and they they were there to help them they said look we need to help you you know this is wrong you shouldn't have to go back to prison so they approached the local sheriff uh, Sheriff Dave Ward there and they said oh, yeah. look you need to protect these folks this is federal overreach they're 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 being subject to double jeopardy you need to protect these guys that don't let the federal government, even if you've got to take them and put them in your own jail until you sort this out, don't let it happen. And if he would have been what we consider to be a constitutional judge where he understood that he needed to protect the, you know, 
In the state of Oregon, the chief law enforcement officers are the 36 county sheriffs that are elected. They are the chief elected officers. Their job is to protect their people in their county mm -hmm. from any federal or state overreach. They, they're, they're the man in that county. So, okay. so they went directly to, to the sheriff and said, Sheriff, there's an abuse here. You need to take care of these hammocks to make sure that they don't go back to jail. Mm -hmm. And the, the sheriff, he, ref, he, he really didn't, he re, kind of refused. And, and actually the federal prosecutor contacted the Hammonds and they, and they said, if you don't stop talking to Eamon Bundy, we're gonna pick you up early and send you to a not, de, not as desirable of a prison. Hmm. They're trying, you know, so because they didn't like this narrative that said, you know, the federal government doesn't have the right to own this land. This land belongs to the people of the state of Oregon. It should be managed by the counties. We need to have these federal folks out of here. This land should be managed for the benefit of the folks in every single county. Mm -hmm. You know, in the county that they live, they need, they need to be the ones managing that and getting the resources. So, so anyway, this whole thing occurred. They had the rally right before the Hammonds went back to jail, which was the beginning of January, where they had 300 people that were rallying right. to their defense, mm -hmm. and they actually talked to Dwight and Steve Hammond just before they went to jail. And the Hammonds were scared. I mean, they were done fighting, you know. They, they the had Bundys, been... Let's, let's clarify. Now, the Bundys are not Oregon. Went Oregon well, right? yeah. It, From it, what I understand, Eamon right. Bundy currently lives in, in Emmett, Idaho. Okay. His okay. dad, Clive Bundy, okay. was the one that had the... They, they had the standoff in, in Nevada okay. where the federal government backed down. They were going to seize his cattle and sell them. He was a rancher, too. He was a rancher. Yeah. So, 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 this, so you're talking about Ammon Bundy and Ryan Bundy, who are right. two of the sons. Right. Of, and Ryan's the older one, and Ammon was kind of okay. the spokesman. And part of this group was Lavoy Finnecum, mm -hmm. which, right. right. which is also a rancher. And a he's, rancher he's kind of right across the border from Clive mm. in Arizona. Mm. So Arizona and, and Nevada, they're for, those two ranches are for... for so ranchers have been having issues with... BLM. They've been having with, issues. They've been around having the country issues. For that yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. And, and one of the reasons is because, you know, when you, when you think about it, the, the Constitution says that we are guaranteed a Republican form of government. That means mm. that those people that are over you, exercising uh, authority over you, if, they're, if they abuse you in any way, you should have the right and the ability to vote them out and vote somebody else in that's going to protect your, mm -hmm. you know, your interests. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the case with BLM. Those folks are, you know, you, you're, you're talking about somebody who is hired by somebody, who's hired by somebody, who's, you go up the chain, the, you know, the, the Department of Interior is an appointed position by the president. So, so you don't have, people don't have the right to elect these folks. And so when they have an agenda where they want to get control of, of land and buy it for pennies on the dollar, you know, they can make these people's life miserable. And over time, these grazing rights that predate, I mean, 1936 was when they, when they passed what's called the Hartley Grazing Act, where they basically, mm -hmm. the government took control of all these grazing rights and said to the farmers and ranchers, hey, we're here to help you. Hmm. You know, we're here to help you manage these, you know, and whatnot. But, but a lot of these guys, these grazing rights are property rights that predated this act. So, you know, being a real estate agent, I understand property rights, you know. Hmm. But part of property rights are water rights, hmm. rights to hmm. water, you know, right. to access to water, mm -hmm. to water your crops. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is these grazing rights. Mm -hmm. So when you bought a piece of land, um, if, if, if the, there was public land around yours and you were grazing your cattle every, there, every year and you used that, that you developed a right by use. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then over time, you know, that was your, and people were killed for, yeah. you know, overstep, step. you know, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. water and, and yeah. Yeah. you know, oh, somebody yeah. else comes oh, yeah. in and yeah. want to graze on your yeah. property oh, yeah. that you'd already oh, yeah. established a ride on, you shoot oh, yeah. them. I mean, yeah. that, 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 <laughs> that, that's, that's you know, that's but once those are established, right, as rights, then as, they're sold, as that ranch is sold, you're, you're not only selling the property, the actual physical land that, that the ranch is on, there's also rights on the public lands for grazing yeah. and, and access to water to feed your cattle. So those are all things that, that go with this. The BLM was restricting the Hammonds, uh, you know, they, they, with all the 
environmental things, um, you yeah. know, the, the, the different animals and things that they're trying to protect mm -hmm. and different oh, wildlife, okay. they start restricting the number of actual cattle they can run on these for certain, you know, used to maybe you run 100 head, well now they're saying, well, you can only run 50 this year and you, and you gotta shorten how long you can have them on there. And so all these restrictions are put on them so that all of a sudden they're restricting their grazing rights and they're yeah. charging them for those rights and whatnot. So, so anyway, uh, uh, the Hammonds had a fight over water rights and, and with the BLM. They tried to fence them out of their water rights. They tried to you know, do all kinds of things. Well, the Hammonds took them to court in the 90s and they won in state court to say, mm -hmm. the state of Oregon said, no, they have a right to this water. It's a water right that it was been established. You can't fence them. You can't, you know, put a gate on that road. It's a county road. It's not a BLM road. Little easement, little easement. Yeah, so you, can't, you can't do that. Right, so yeah, anyway, right. they lost and the BLM didn't like losing. Hmm. So these guys have, been, have suffered abuse for a long time. And you talk to a lot of the different ranchers over there and different videos I've seen where, you know, uh, Ken Taylor's done some interviews with folks, uh, to, with ranchers that have talked about what they've had to put up with. And they're just, they're, they're pushed to the limit here. And so, um, so anyway, after the Bundys went back, or the, the Hammonds went back to jail, these folks took over that refuge in the beginning of January. They just occupied, it was vacant. They just moved in there and they said, look, we're, this refuge is why the Hammonds have been abused, trying to get this as part of the refuge. We're occupying this. 30 miles outside of Bend, mm. the sheriff, bar when, as soon as they did that, he barricades the, the county buildings. He, you know, he calls in the FBI, he calls in sheriffs from all these other counties to come in and help him protect the people. He's calling the shots. He, yeah, but, but, I mean, these guys weren't, they weren't violent. You know, the, and any time you have a group like this, there there are those attached that, that show up that aren't necessarily attached to the group that cause problems. Mm -hmm. And I mean, personally, I believe they just had some loose cannons in town that that were maybe causing some problems. But, you know, the fire chief over there, he resigned because, you know, he had heard that some of these some of these uh, uh, things were going on, vandalism type stuff. He caught a couple guys out by the by the armory there. Uh, and, and, and so he pulled them over and he's trying to figure out who they were. And the guy says, hey, well, we're thinking about having a business in town. And the guy and the, the chief says, well, uh, they don't have businesses in the armory. And the guy goes, well, we weren't coming from the armory. And he says, well, I, I followed you. Right. And he said, well, we we're looking for some place to hunt. Didn't add up. So he took down the guy, the two guys' license plate numbers and he had them run. They were undercover FBI agents. Oh. OK, so so he went to Steve Grasty, the judge. And he talked to him, and this is, I saw this on a video. He talked to the judge and he said, hey, you know, these guys are undercover FBI agents. And he was basically told to mind his own business and he's an old guy, he didn't, you know, he didn't matter. So he resigned right there, he wrote out a thing and he went out to the refuge and he had a press conference and he exposed this thing and, and whatnot. That's how got but on. the thing was, the Bundys out at the refuge, people were going out there taking them supplies, they were hanging out out there, you know, uh, with fire, so it, it wasn't like they were violent. I mean, lots of people from the community went out there to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. And myself, I went over there one day. I was gonna go. I was gonna go out and see them, but I thought, okay, I'm gonna go see the sheriff first. So you know, I, I, I saw um, Sheriff Dave Ward, and also uh, the sheriff from Malheur County was there, Sheriff Wolf, and he's the head of the uh, Oregon Sheriffs Association. Okay. He was there, and there was another sheriff. Well, anyway, they, they, they gave me this song and dance about, you know, how this, you know, these guys were uh, different people of the group were causing vandalism in town and death threats and all this kind of stuff. And, and, but, but I had told them, okay, look, I, if you don't think I can help, I won't go out there. So I, I didn't go out and meet, I wish I would have now, but I didn't go out to meet Ammon and Lavoy and those guys out there. But um, so... One of the things that they were doing was they weren't just staying at that refuge. They had meetings in different counties where they were actually starting to educate the ranchers about what their rights were, what the Constitution says. Uh, and, and the reason they had to go to other counties was the judge there in town, uh, you know, Eamon came in and he, he, he said to folks, look, if you want to, um, if things aren't happening the way that you need it to happen and you have grievances, you need to form a, sa a, 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 a safety committee committee of safety where you, you list your grievances and you take them to your, your politicians and you say, hey, 
here's the things that we, you know, we need to have happen here in our county that are wrong. So they formed a committee and they started doing this. Well, the judge restricted, they couldn't even have meetings. If, they, if, the, if the judge or, or one of those guys wasn't in charge of a meeting, they shut down all the public buildings in town so these folks couldn't even meet anywhere. So they started you know, having the meetings in different counties. And so, um, and of course, and it, you know, they didn't have any violence. There was no gunshots anywhere. Well, Bruce, let me break in at this Go point ahead. in time. Here's it. Now, the question I'm going to ask you now, where, where are the people's representatives? What happened to the governor? Did the governor get involved in, this, in the process? He says when, he wants to clear involved. it up as quickly yeah, as possible. When, yeah, and, and so, secondly, so I, the last time, I, the thing I saw, and I'm, I, mean, I, I naturally look at, uh, look at some of the stuff back in D.C., you know, at, at the big house, if you will, right. and I saw uh, Congressman Greg Walden. Mm -hmm. He was making his speech. Right. And then I had, then there was Congressman uh, Earl Blumenauer from this particular county. I'm, right. And the question I'm asking, what's he doing over here? He's yeah. not a rancher. He, right. he doesn't even represent that right. area over there. Right. I know DeFazio was up in that area, right? right. In fact, I was going to ask you, where's DeFazio? So where are the leadership that we elect? Mm -hmm. you sh they, should, they should be sitting right here in your spot talking about this stuff. Exactly. And here you are. You, you spent all this time and effort. Now you have to run for governor just to make sure you get this issue on the table. And I'm glad you are because otherwise we wouldn't have had you here. Well, and, and, I, and, we I, and, I, and I believe so they could have resolved this peacefully if, Why the, didn't? if the governor had not got involved and, and pushed the FBI to doing something and writing a letter to the president basically saying you need to do something. Yeah, and really when it comes that. down to it, the, they they said they were spending X amount of do, you know I don't know they yeah, said yeah, you know yeah, so yeah, they were yeah. spending a lot of money. Well, you know what? Uh, that was that was the choice of law enforcement over there to spend that kind of money, and it basically all it did was scare the daylights out of the population when when there wasn't really it wasn't necessary, you know. And so they but they brought in all the they brought in the FBI, they brought the feds, the federal government into their county to actually take over jurisdiction. Whereas the county sheriff is the one that should have took control of that whole situation, and he could have resolved that peacefully. But he kept passing the buck off, says, hey, it's a, it's a federal but again, property. When, when, where is the governor? The so state, the, right? So the that's, governor that's pushed, the, governor pushed the president who pushed back on the FBI to get okay. it resolved. And what about the congressman? And, 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 and your senators? Well, you know, Greg Walden, to, to, his, uh, to his credit, he... He went, I mean, he, when he gave his speech, he was talking about the frustration that these ranchers have had to deal with. He understands, he, he knows the Hammonds, he understands the frustration. I don't believe he thinks that these folks ought to be in jail either. They should but, be. But was, yeah. he there in, was he there at the site talking to these? I, I never saw him on, on the tube. Well, I you know, see him on at, at, at one, I saw him up in Congress, right? Then, but I didn't right. see him doing the yeah, thing. Yeah, and, and I don't. And Did that, he do that? I don't have an answer to that. I, I don't you know. know I don't what know what Earl kind of, Did Earl Blumenau show up there? On, no. On the the, site? Only, the only comment that I heard that I thought was pretty interesting was uh, when Ron Wyden said he basically indicated that he, these people were viruses, and we got to stop what? the spread of the virus. What? You know, and so 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 here here's where we are. You got one. You got one narrative, the government narrative. Mm -hmm. And if you go, if, and if anybody else comes along and says, "Hey, you know, the, what they're doing is they have a different opinion. This is unconstitutional," you know. It, it, and so you start talking to people about, you know, the BLM shouldn't own this land. This is unconstitutional. All of a sudden, that's not the government narrative. And in fact, I was trying to get this across to, to Sheriff Ward and Sheriff Wolf. And basically, Sheriff Ward, his eyes kind of glazed over, and he goes, man, you sound like one of these. You've bought into this idea. Yeah. And I told Sheriff Ward, I said, listen, I've been talking about getting local control back and getting control of the federal lands back way before the Bundy showed up. I was talking about that two years ago when I ran for governor, when I was going around the state in mm -hmm. eastern Oregon with Dennis Linthicum when he was running. We were talking about that in eastern Oregon, that we mm -hmm. need to get these federal lands back. So, so but, but, but now that narrative that the Bundys brought, now it's suspect, you know? So now anybody that is talking about this mm -hmm. is suspect of, uh, of being subversive and anti-government, you know, and the militias are painted in a broad brush like they are some kind of anti-government folks. No, the militia wants to have constitutional sheriffs in every single county that protect the citizens and they want to have the federal government actually live up and, and, and abide by what the Constitution says. That is what they're saying. 
And, and when they see federal overreach like this, the militia is ready to come in and protect the citizens if the sheriff won't. And that's what happened in Harney County. Mm. So because the sheriff wouldn't do his job, because Kate Brown, you know, was well, pressuring them, I mean, but, but, the, they were pushing this. So, so these, guys were, these guys were on the way to, mm -hmm. to Grant County, which has a constitutional sheriff, Sheriff Glenn Palmer there, Constitution Sheriff, doesn't allow the, the, govern, the federal government to operate with police powers in his county, right? These folks were going to meet 300 other people where, they, where Ammon was going to do some education, mm -hmm. Lavoie was going to do some educating. One of the gals that was in that car, her and her family were going to sing. They sing yeah. patriotic Cox. songs. Cox. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was uh, Victoria Sharp. She yeah, was going to sing, yeah. sing with her yeah. family that was already there waiting for her. And they ambushed them in that canyon. Yeah. You guys right. seen the video. I mean, you know, they had the roadblock set up there. That, that was a deadly force type roadblock. I mean, they, and they were shooting at them from the get-go. As soon as they pulled them over, you know, uh, the, the testimony from the, the two gals were, you know, they stuck their hands out, head and hands out and said, hey, look, we got women in the car. And they shot at yeah. them right away. So when Lavoy took off, I mean, he was, he was, he was obviously, he was thinking he was going to get to Grant County, have a constitutional sheriff protect him, and, and you know, get out of the situation. When he came around that corner, and here they were, you know. And I think if he really wanted to hurt somebody, he would have just plowed his truck right into those, to that, to that thing. But he didn't. He veered off to the side, and, right. you know, you see the guy shoot his windshield out, you know, and he veered even further off because he didn't want to hit that guy. So I don't think, I mean, if you... There's some videos out there where Lavoie yeah. talks about stuff. He is not a terrorist. You watch those. No, There's no way you can, well, you can say that. that. That's a couple other points you might make. You have to understand again, too. Somebody had to sign off. Yeah. I mean, these are employees. They were, they were doing their job as they were told. Yeah, I you understand. Know, you've been in the military like I've been in the military. Yep. When you're given the orders, you do what you're told, right? You don't question anything. So my point is that who signed off? And right up front with the signers, if you will. But here again, no, but here again, no, Bruce. You don't shoot somebody with their hands no, in the no, air. No, but that's what I'm saying. <laughs> this not but they're gonna always fall back yeah. to the same point that hey, so and so told me to do this. I was trained this yeah. way. You know, we we we've gone through that whole issue with the yeah. police thing. I mean, bottom line. So the thing is that who signed off? And I, you know, I keep going back. You know, they might be some good guys, if you will, but. But we need some good. We need leadership now. Yes, you know, we do. and in all due respect, the leadership from Oregon should have taken the taken the lead on yeah. this deal. The governor, in all due respect, should have responded. In all due respect, and then our congressional delegation. I'm talking all of them. Well, well all of them should have gone down there well, and said, "Hey, Mr. President, we got a problem in Oregon. In fact, BLM is a problem in this entire United States. We need to sit down and discuss well, this issue." And there again, the Indians are involved. Got screwed. And the Pius yep, got screwed yep. in that deal too. So. Yep. So that's where we are. That's, that's what I'm here. Right. Anything you? Anything? But politically, when, when, when the folks that are protesting don't agree with your agenda, I mean, you, you, you saw the hypocrisy there. When, when the folks that were protesting, I mean, some of these other places in the country where they destroyed and they burnt towns and, you know, oh, yeah, they oh, never yeah, got oh, prosecuted yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And, and, and they just let them do whatever they wanted to do. Well, in, in this case, Politically, they didn't agree with what they were doing because they they were ex they were exercising their Second Amendment rights, yeah, yeah. And, and they wanted to kill them yeah. like right now. Yeah. They'll just yeah. wipe those guys out, you know, and all the all the taunting well, of the Al Qaeda and all well, that kind the, of stuff that went you on. Do know, ridiculous! You do, you do ridiculous! We do have issues right now. Oh yeah, and we got we got a we got a presidential <laughs> race. We got some major issues. Yes, we do. And that's why we have you here. In all due respect, I I, I, I vetted you out because I knew you had a, some background. And, and you could share with us and educate us, because that's what mm -hmm. we need to do. Because that's what we do here at Community yeah. Television. Educate and inform, and that's what yeah. we're doing. Right. So the name of the game is that uh, we've gone so far in terms of how folks represent us, the people, Right. that it's gotten out of hand. Yeah. Now, that's why, in all due respect, uh, from the presidential race, that's why you got the Donald Trump's where he's at, because he's basically saying, hey, look here, I don't need the money. I'm he's tapped into the anger. He's jumped he in has. that piece yep. on the end of aspect of it. And so it, it's a problem. But we're going to get through this. This still is the greatest country in the world. You bet it you know is. You, know you bet it and is. So my point is that that's why we're having the discussion. And hopefully, uh, uh, it's, it's really sad that people are getting killed behind that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was well, horrific. Richard, I got a question. Yeah, go on, Richard. The four people that are still there now, I know we're, I'm jumping ahead. 
Yeah, good one. Do you have any thoughts on what should be done with those? Well, you know, Aim and Bundy has spoken from from the jail cell and said, "Hey guys, yeah. the give statement's up. been made. Give up." Yep. Yeah. You know, so so. They don't act like the, well, the, don't the act problem is that, that, that these guys want to walk free without being arrested. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not going to happen. Yeah, happen. No, you know, the, happen. The, the the difference between those guys and Aim and Bundy was, I think he knew what the he knew what the cost was, and he was willing to pay the cost. You know, he. I think he understood that he was probably going to go to jail over this. Ranchers but, and none ranchers. But he. But he's willing to say, look, you know, there. There's a bigger issue than me being in jail. We've. We've got to get yeah. the public he's educated the about. Right. We've yeah. got to get the. Yeah. And he's yeah. going to use his court case right. to right. educate further on. You know, that that we need to get these federal lands back, and this overreach must yeah. stop. We're going to have a discussion. They've got to have, have a discussion. But see, right now. The problem is with the discussion is now it's in the court system and anybody that has that narrative that Bundy is, is saying, like, because I agree with a lot mm -hmm, of the stuff, mm -hmm. well, they're suspect. Well, you're not suspect. You're well, not I know, but, but I, I know, but what I'm saying He's not a well, suspect. Okay, listen, listen, well, Here, here's what suspect. I'm talking about, though, we Bruce. We just want to know what's going on. Here, here's what I'm, I'm talking about. the bill. The, the <laughs> sheriff in the other county, he's, he's a constitutional sheriff, okay. right? He's, he belongs to constitutional sheriff's national organization, oh. Glenn Palmer. Because he made statements that said uh -huh. basically, hey, if they want to solve this, they, per they could start by releasing the Hammonds, right? And, oh, and that he that actually is. he actually met with these guys and they walked in and out of his county and you know so and because he 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 opinion wise yeah. he is he yeah. is he believes he's, he's being he's investigated now because yeah. yeah. he's suspect. Yeah. See yeah. that's wrong. Yeah. This is America. Mm -hmm. You know we, we we bring things to the table. We don't we don't start crucifying the other yeah. guy because he has a different opinion than us. And we've gotten to that point. You know there's other things that are going on. Um, look, you know we're, look, we're all I, you know we're, we're all frustrated. But the fact oh, yeah. that is we're going to get we got to be here. able to talk. We got to get yeah. through. Now you're going to be running for governor. And I, I am running sure for governor. I'm sure that the people know yes. in Oregon that you're running for governor and you want what's right. Yep. And that's why I said I vetted you and we talked about this is a major piece right here. Yes, it is. And it involves everybody, all the elected officials for that matter. You got yep. me? Yep. And the people are frustrated. Yep. We're tired mm -hmm. of it. And I don't like the idea of here we are discussing something that, that, that uh, we want to understand and, and then all of a sudden we're suspect to. Right. Give me a break. Right. You know what I mean? Right. We're doing this publicly. That's what America's are. It's right. a government of the people, by the people, right. and for the people. Okay. Right. And Amen. so we just have to discuss this issue. Now, uh, so, so as, as Richard was saying, where do we go from here? What do you think? Where, do, where should we go from here? I well, mean, we, I, we've talked. Well, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I think, where should we go? I, I think, you know, hopefully they're going to end this thing peace, peaceably over there without anybody else getting killed. Yeah. Okay, that's one. You know, okay. That's uh, good. Okay. But, but I, I think one of, the, one of the places that we need to start is, is we need to allow these guys that are currently held without bail they're not flight risks. I don't even think they even have passports. You know, they're they're not going anywhere. I mean, they 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 were not violent. That you know that we're treating them as if they're murderers or or you know. I mean, you know, you, you talk about uh, you know prisons that have nonviolent criminals in yeah. it that we shouldn't have them there. Well, these guys aren't violent. Somebody exercising their Second Amendment rights to carry a weapon. That's not violent. You know, I mean, that's a right that we right. have. But, but, so, so, you know, first thing to do, with, 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 let's let these guys get out of jail. Let, let's let them get back to their families, you know, and go through this trial and have this discussion and allow them to where they can actually, you know. So, uh, so, so you're saying that if 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 elected governor, that would be the that would be the word that would, that would be the word you'd get out, if you will. Yeah. For those elected officials and the, and the president of these United States. Hey, look, this is this is our position here in Oregon. Yeah. Right? Well, oh, we can vote on it. Well, right? and, and part of it, too, is they've connected Eamon Bundy's uh, uh, stand in jail with these other four guys that They're are refusing ranchers. to give up. They're not ranchers. That are few, refusing to give are up. Are they ranchers? But he has no control over no, them. are they ranchers? Who's that? The people that are in there. Now. I, I have no idea. No idea. See, the, I thought they were are, using them for leverage. To get them four guys out. Yeah. Well, they are, but see that that doesn't have anything to do with him. Yeah, that, that, you know, he's repeatedly that's not the issue. said that's not the issue. Yeah, exactly. That, that's what we're talking. We're yeah. not talking. That's not the issue. Yeah. And so that, but that needs to be resolved because because no, and I, 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 the way I'm looking at it is they just want to be mortars. Maybe they got some other they got other issues. Everybody's got know. issues. You gotta remember that. Bruce. Yeah. But you know, the the saddest thing is though, though that the the I Finnegan family that. lost Lavoie. Oh yeah, that was. Yeah. I mean that 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 we we can't yeah. we can't go yeah. back and replace yeah. that. Yeah. But you know what? I mean, 
Yeah. We have to make sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah, I agree. That that I agree. that because he was a he was a good, a good man, man and yeah. he did not he did not bring that on himself. And uh, you know uh, what, when I saw that, I just I couldn't believe it. I mean I and and, and you know even even the there's two eyewitnesses to to this. You know Shauna Cox and Victoria Sharp, yeah. and their testimonies were given at two different yeah. times on yeah. tape, and yeah. they agree. And the, the the sad part about it is the narrative that the media has picked up is from that guy Mark McConnell that was actually the driver of Bundy's car, mm -hmm. and he was nowhere near. I mean, if you watch the video, how far Lavoie drove away from where they were, the news media has been given his side of the story, and he was a farther. He was a mile or so away. He couldn't have saw anything, you know. But. There again, Shauna Cox thinks that he was an FBI plant, so that they all that yeah. so that they left and they got into that canyon at the same time because they were going to leave at two different times. But Shauna said that Mark was adamant about the fact that they needed to go together, and after the fact, she thought about that and said that was odd because some other people had already gone ahead, but he wanted to keep these two vehicles together, and of course, and of course, he was immediately released. Mm -hmm. He was not one of them that was charged in TEP. Right? He was immediately released, and and he made a video right away that that. Uh, and one of the women you saw, Sharp, I think, was released yeah. too. Was she? Yeah, she's yeah. a well, she was an 18-year-old girl that mm -hmm. had basically was going to go sing with her family, patriotic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and Christian songs mm -hmm. uh, as entertainment for mm -hmm. the, these 300 mm -hmm. people that were meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, because 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 part of the thing these meetings, these are patriots in my opinion, because they start these meetings with. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. a prayer oh, yeah. and, so, and some great music. And then they go into talking about the Constitution and what it says well, and what well, rights you well, have. Bruce, now you do understand nowadays. That's patriots. We, yes. But you got to understand nowadays we don't do that as much as we used to. Well, I know. We don't do that now. Because that, it's now, not so right. politically so, correct well, anymore. Well, bottom you line know? is that, I mean, that's, that was the glue, <laughs> if you will. That was the glue that put us all yes, together. I mean, that's we, right. we've got, we, we represent many flags because we're all immigrants in many ways. Well, and it's amazing. Right after 9/11, what happened? We were singing "God Bless America" on yeah, the Capitol yeah, step. The churches oh, yeah, were yeah, full, yeah, and and yeah. you know all the patriot thing going on. And then you know how why. quickly did that go away? Well, you know why, don't you? Yeah. Because the bomb could be coming on me. Well, yeah. <laughs> is, is that <laughs> an individual <laughs> petition? Yeah, yes, yeah, it is. He's, he's trying to. Well, I'm, he, I'm working on getting my my voters pamphlet done by petition, so I'm I'm working you on get collecting the Otherwise, he had to pay. Signatures. Otherwise, oh, okay. he, he had to come so. up with the money. But he's working. He's a hard working guy. Oh yeah. And he's, oh, yeah. he's willing. To, he stopped knocking on doors, and he, he came all the way down from. Where, where are you living now? Where? I live in Mahama, about Mahama. 25 miles east of Salem. Yeah, you drove yeah. all the way down here. I work out of the Salem yeah, well, Salem Market real estate. Well, you know, in all due respect, you know, I I, I really appreciate appreciate the fact that you, you've come down here with us to talk about these issues because this is a major issue. Yes, it is. And it's a very important issue. And I would hope that in all due respect that the maybe the, the presidential elections get involved in this piece. Mm -hmm. this, this, would be, this would really put it to the table and right. have that major discussion. Right. Because you got media in one aspect of it. They're, they're doing whatever they're supposed to do. And Well, and, and the and, problem with a lot of the presidential candidates, they're, they're from states that... that they got issues too. That, you know? Well, they're from states that the federal government doesn't own over half of the state. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so they're not seeing the federal BLM, yeah. BLM overreach like we That's are. That's why you we've know? got to have some solid leadership you from our state. We got That's a congressional right. delegation. I mean, I remember Ron and Ron Whiten when he was sitting right next to you, right there mm -hmm. when he was a, when he was a state representative. Okay, mm -hmm. I interviewed. You mean him. back when he actually lived in Oregon That's instead right. of instead no, of New York? That's right. <laughs> but, but he no, he, he still, as far as I'm concerned, they're all good guys. Yeah, the point is that yeah, yeah. We, we got to kind of prioritize it back. Yeah. Well, that, that issue with BLM was a big issue. Yes, okay? it is. And so we got to bring all this table to the table. Even the Paiutes, the Indians, yeah. were ripped off big time. Yeah. Right yeah. So that needs to be brought to the table in a civil way. You got my point? Yes. But we got all these other issues that are around that people are looking for some vehicle so that they can take that issue to the front of the line, right? Right. You right. understand what I'm saying? But I, I, this is a sad I, note. And I don't know how much time we got, but I wanted no, 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 to no. mention the, the kind of the one thing I think in, the, in this governor's race is yeah. very, very yeah, important. Go on. Sure, go on. And yeah. that is, that is uh, Kate Brown has made it clear that business is not welcome in Oregon. Oh, okay. That's I mean, she me. she she has said that she's gonna she's gonna ra currently the the businesses pay a billion dollars, everybody in in business taxes, and part of that's his gross receipts tax that they pass, which is which is nothing more than a than a backdoor sales tax. What's a and gross receipt tax? Gross receipts tax is is businesses pay it doesn't 
doesn't talk about profit, doesn't have mm -hmm. anything to do with profit. It has to do with their total gross receipts that they actually sell. They've got to pay a tax, a percentage, based solely on the gross receipts oh, that that business yeah. sells. Hmm. So, so like a rent, sort of like their rent. Well, to you know, here, so to speak. yeah. But but it but it doesn't but you know I mean I'm so 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 to be, to be able to collect that tax okay. they have to raise their prices right. to to consumers like you and me yeah. to cover that tax because mm -hmm. they know it's going to be a certain percentage and so they got whatever they're selling they got to just like a sales tax they got to have mm -hmm. that that amount tacked on which just makes them uncompetitive it's wrong. it well, makes them have uncompetitive you have a profit margin so so so, so the the governor is talking about raising that by 250 percent hmm. we're talking about going from one billion dollars every biennium to 3.5 billion dollars every biennium and then the other and that's that's going to kill the big businesses hmm. or they're going to so here here's what i see they're just by talking about that oregon doing that any businesses that were thinking about coming to oregon they're not and any businesses that are currently here, they are planning their exit strategy right now. Okay. So they're killing us. Mm -hmm. And the other portion of that is the $15 minimum wage that that they're talking about. You know, uh, and a lot. And I know a lot of people that are making minimum wage now look at, wow, I'm going to get a raise. Well, you know what? You're going to get a raise, but the, your cost of living is going to go up so much more because that $15 an hour, you're, you're not going to be able to purchase the things that you used to purchase because everybody's having to pay that. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be, it's going to unproportionately cost the the workers that are making the $15 an hour raise. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I'll bet you there's quite a few of those that are going to lose their jobs because a business can only afford to hire so much That's in right. labor costs. Mm -hmm. right. And so they're going to cut some people. So it's going to cost jobs. So between those two, Running business out of the state, raising the minimum wage, you're just you're killing the state of Oregon and and, and you know and, and she's backing the unions have said, Hey, we, we, we want this gross receipts tax. PERS has got a big hole in it, we gotta cover that somehow. Right. Let's raise yeah. the tax. So Oh, okay. Wow. We we are there. Okay. Uh, just one more summing up. Go on, buddy. Uh, Go ahead. His, his name and running for Yes, yes, right. Go over that. Okay. Okay, I want to got, thank the crew very much. For very, very much so. Okay, well, fine. And we've got Bruce Cuff here, candidate for Oregon governor, and he's given us a, a, an, o, a, an outlook on this whole issue with Harney County and that, that piece, and I think it's really yeah. good. The BLM and whatever, we did an excellent job. We really, That's really right. thank you. appreciate this. And hopefully you, the viewing audience, you have a better understanding of what's going on in that particular area on that particular subject. It's huge for the state of Oregon and our livability, right? Right. Again, okay. again, thank you very much, Richard, for giving me the opportunity oh, to oh, do this. Oh, thank, okay. And thank uh, Portland Community Media. Right, That's right. Yeah. We're really in their place. Appreciate yeah. that, appreciate okay. that. Thank you, guys. But I think we're uh, just about there.